Savior, Jesus Christ. Where do you live? That's an easy answer. It's a, in fact, it's an, an opening line and you're trying to establish some common ground with someone you've just met. And I could ask this crowd over here, where do you live? And we get lots of different answers as they come from all sorts of places. Not that we don't get a lot of answers over this side either, but uh, they do. So it's, it's, where do you live? But the question, of course, if I'm asking in a sermon, is a little deeper than that. Because it's, where do you really live? What is your area of expertise? What is your, you know, what is life for you? Where do you live? Because people differ. And it has become quite evident that the two primary uh, candidates for president live in different places. I'm not just talking about where their house is, but boy, they have a different perspective on their realities. In fact, it makes it difficult for us as we're voting for it because you, you're not just looking at two different platforms. You've got this candidate over here and what he says his platform is, this candidate, what he says his platform is, but you also have what this candidate says this candidate's platform is, and what he says his platform is. So now if you're gonna look at it seriously, you have to look at all four platforms, right? Because you don't live, well, you might live closer to one than the other, but you're beginning to really now get serious about, okay, if I vote for this one, or if I vote for this one, which one is going to be closer with where I live, with what I understand about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness here in the United States of America? Well, you have a daunting task ahead of you and only uh, seven, eight, nine days or so to look at it. Unless you're one of those early voter people, I tried to be yesterday, but the line was way too long over here at uh, Kingsview Middle School. We may try again later on this afternoon, or if, uh, maybe tomorrow, or if we don't get rained out. But anyway, we're gonna vote. It's important. It's important. Today we're focusing on it, where do you live? The scriptures talk about it in the Old Testament lesson from Revelation, which is full of, of, of symbolic language. And it talking about that there's this, the reason that this text is, is for this day, Reformation Day, is because uh, it's, it's remembering the uh, event on let's see, October 31st in 1517 when uh, Martin Luther had some problems, this, this monk, this professor in the, in the University of Wittenberg, had some challenges. There were some things going on in his church that, that he had questions about. And so he posted up on the, the local bulletin board, at, which is the chapel door uh, at the uh, university chapel, and he posted up these uh, 95 statements uh, for discussion, for debate didn't draw a lot of attention amongst the people there in Wittenberg because uh, as one guy would get up and look at it and say, oh, it's in Latin. You know, and they didn't, you know, if he could read at all, to know the difference between Latin. And, most people in those days couldn't read, with even, even the nobility, uh, because, well, there wasn't anything to read. All the, all the books had to be handwritten, hand-copied, uh, because the printing press was invented, but it wasn't into mass production kind of thing yet. So there were no books to read anyway. They were too expensive. And uh, so Luther has posted this challenge. That it's a 
debate amongst the scholars uh, to present things. And uh, uh, so he, he was working on that. That's what we celebrate is that posting. It's not just the Lutheran Reformation because there were other people that had uh, tried to reform things uh, 100 years before Luther. There were others that were working at the same time as Luther. That just that, oh, about when our country was in the 1600s, uh, they finally picked on this particular date and that became the celebration. Uh, I don't know if it's just in this country or elsewhere as well, also in Europe. But uh, we have some present and former members of the Roman Catholic Church among us today. And uh, just to set your mind at ease, I am not going to hear and uh, uh, set forth all the uh, problems that Luther had with the Roman Catholic Church. Just said easy. Because if you take all, many of the things that he said were wrong with his church in that day, we have to be very careful and very vigilant for whatever Christian branch of the family we are, that we're all being careful that that doesn't happen to us. Because what was in that day basically is that there was, there was, there was a wall. You know, we talk about a wall of separation of church and state. Well, the wall was around church and state and it was all together in that day. And when you take the secular and the sacred and you put it together, so that it's kind of hard to know which kind of directions and laws are coming from the state and which ones are coming from the church, it's going to be a whole lot bigger problems than we have today. But Luther was trying to fix that, to separate, to get them back to what was important. And when finally Luther died, as many people say, that guy's gone. Okay, uh, when Luther finally died, this Old Testament lesson from, or not Old Testament, the first lesson for Revelation was the text for his sermon. And Pastor Bugenhagen uh, called Luther this other angel. Uh, we don't hold him to that. Luther was one of many. In fact, hopefully you all are that angel. Angel are messengers. That's what the word angel means. And what Luther was, uh, what he did was to, to bring people back to the scriptures. Uh, because the, the, uh, uh, the revelation text talks about to the, at a high and high in the air that this gospel message is coming to those dwelling on the earth. Well, in revelations, dwelling is, doesn't mean everybody. Revelation draws a differentiation between those who are dwelling in the earth, who are abiding, living in and of the earth. In other words, they're involved in all the sinful things that we as sinful human beings get involved in. They are dwelling, they are, they're abiding in the sin of the world. For the saints, they sit in the world. When, it, when Revelation is talking about the saints, they sit in the world. It's like, you know, a sit, a stool is a, a, a temporary place. You know, in the bar or in the kitchen or wherever. You know, it's a temporary position. You're going to get up and go because you don't live there. That's just a stool sitting place. That's the concept. That maybe you've heard the song, the title of which is, I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home. So that's why Luther was one of many of us who proclaim the gospel of Christ to those who are sitting and or dwelling in the earth. Because the gospel, and that's what Luther wanted to do, is to get, like he said, the people didn't have Bibles. So they had to believe whatever they were told. And some people, some pastors could tell it well, and some couldn't. That's what Luther, he was kind of a, a circuit pastor, and he had the responsibility to go around the neighboring congregations and, and examine the pastors and the parents to see if they had some understanding of the scriptures. And he was appalled. You know, it's kind of like the surveys that we run today. Uh, ask Christians, you know, who uh, uh, various kinds of things, and, and they really don't know. You know, they don't ask them. You don't have to ask difficult questions like I do in my sermons like that. Like, who are the only two people who didn't die? Besides what Jesus did. So, uh, you know, those trivial questions like, uh, who didn't die in the wilderness? You know, which two, uh, all those kind of quick questions. This is, you know, like, 
never mind. <laughs> they didn't know. So Luther helped them. And one of the things that he did to help the people to get into the Word, because that's where we're going with this, to dwell. Where do we need to dwell? We need to dwell in the Word of God. Dwell in the Word of God. They couldn't do it in Luther's day because there was no Bibles. The first thing, that, one of the things that Luther did was he translated the Bible, both the Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament, into the German language. There were others who had done that, were beginning to do that for other languages, but Luther did it for the German people so that his people there could have access. And the printing press was getting going, and they began to print it up. And people, it became, the prices came down so that there were, you know, at least a Bible per community and to the point that it finally became neighborhoods and, and there were Bibles to begin around. And people could get into it and read for themselves. They didn't have to take some pastor's opinion. They could go read it themselves. Today, we have a plethora of translations in almost every language. So the people can dwell in the Word of God. Because as Jesus said in the New Testament, in the Gospel lesson for today, yeah. that if you abide in my Word, you will have the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, the Pharisees who were standing there talking, listening to, to Jesus, they, they protested that. They said, free, we're not slaves to anybody. What are you talking about? Now, these Pharisees were great scholars. And they knew a lot about translating the scriptures in those days from the Hebrew text into something that the people could understand. Not that they did all that great a job, because they also seemed to have forgotten history. You know, they said, because we're children of Israel, we've been free, we've been slaves to no one. What about Egypt? What about Assyria? Babylonia? The Persians? The Greeks? And in Jesus' day, the Romans. They were slaves. <laughs> so there, they abided in a different concept of what the world's reality was and they felt themselves to be free from all of that. Well, Jesus says no. He says anyone who sins you know God's laws and if you commit a sin you are a slave to sin. Now any of us that are really honest about our lives and the way we lead those lives. We can think of some good things that we have done. Maybe even attribute that to God's help in us that we have done some good things. But if you're truly honest about yourself and you join with us in the, in the confession at the beginning of the service, you know, and that's one of the things that Luther did when he wrote an explanation to each of the Ten Commandments. He not only said, this is what you should do, but this is what you need to do to keep this. You know, like Jesus said, you were taught you shall not kill. But I tell you, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. That begins to understand the process. And then what Luther added to that is not only don't hate, don't kill. But if you don't help him in his bodily needs, you are killing him. Or if you do something to aggravate, you are shortening their life. You know, that whole kind of process. Luther wasn't the only one. There's been a lot of others that have done that kind of definition. But if you're that kind of honest, not just with thou shalt not kill, but all the other Ten Commandments that are not just suggestions and do the best you can, but the command of God, then you begin to understand how you too are a slave to sin. And what Jesus is talking about, and, and, well, and the writer to the second lesson, and he says that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. Not one of us is perfect. Then how can we be set free from sin? 
That's what Jesus came for. That's the truth. Is that Jesus Christ came to live, to die, to take our place on the cross. So that his sacrifice for us would pay for all of our sins. And that's what he did. And that's the truth. Now the problem with not just our generation, but almost every generation of sinners, is that we can't fathom that truth. You know, I don't want to say it the way that the actor did in that run movie that really stuck in our, you can't handle the truth. Everybody knows that line. Okay. But you can. If you dwell in the word of God, you begin to see that truth. Now the world, even in the churches, in all Christian churches, there are supposed recognized scholars of the scriptures that are not reading what the scriptures say, but are trying to undermine it, to cut it out from under it, its authority, its effectiveness, its truths. And they're trying to destroy it because our culture, as many other sinful cultures, likes to establish our own realm of what is true. We want to say, we want to establish what my truth is. I want to set up my own rules. I want to be in control of where I live. That's called anarchy. As each person does that. God set forth the standards. God set forth the ideals. God set forth the manual for the human body in which we live in. And when we don't hear, mark, and inwardly digest what he has to say in the scriptures, then we're working to break it down, to destroy it, to bring on the consequences of sin. Because there are always consequences for our decisions. So Jesus said, it will set you free. And that's what the writer of the second lesson said today. And this is what Luther pointed at. It's the last line in the second lesson on the back of the bulletin. The center focus of what we all need to remember is that we believe and teach that we are justified by faith alone. A gift of God. It's not by works. Otherwise we could boast. Otherwise we could say, look, I'm like the Pharisees. They did it all right. But they had it all wrong. Because it doesn't come by our works. We can do nothing before God. We can do nothing. It's only as the Holy Spirit comes into us and he does it. Now that's what we're going to do at baptism. We have four baptisms this morning. Magnificent. Baptism is God's biblical way of giving to us forgiveness of sins. He says in baptism, I declare you to be my child. The only way you can be God's child is to be holy. Because God is holy and perfect. So he declares us like the judge that has the, the, uh, the criminal in front of him. And the criminal is trying to, to confess his guilt. And the judge says, but I declare you to be holy. Why does God do that? Because he wants that criminal to live with him. Now, if you've done something horrible and you hear from God, your sins are forgiven, you know it's horror, you know it's wrong, you ask God to forgive you, and he says, you're forgiven. He does that because Christ died for your sin. We can't pay him back. We can't try to be good so he'll love us more. He can't love us any more than he already has or given his life for us. But that's what it's all about. He says, It's a gift of God. And in this gift of baptism this morning, God will give each of these children his Holy Spirit. It says, as a down payment on eternal life. It's his. It's hers. 
in baptism. God has adopted into his family his children. And he says, now, grow up. And the sponsors, that's part of their job along with the parents to raise these children in the word. So that they're sitting here on earth. They're in the world, but not of the world. Raise them to understand, to know of the good news of Jesus Christ. As we become the angels, the messengers of God to our children. As they grow so that even as children, they can help to proclaim that message of God's love to their world. So that they dwell not in it, but not of it. All of us, that's our job. Till Jesus comes to be God's messengers, God's angels, to serve, to protect, to show God's love to other people. That's why God has us here as families, as communities of faith. And there are many different Christian communities of faith. That's one of the blessings of denominationalism. If you don't like Catholicism, you can take a look at Lutherans. It's very close. If you're not into all that Mumbo jumbo liturgy, go be a Baptist or Pentecostal or community church. You know, if you don't like big ones, go to little ones. If you don't like little ones, go to a big one. If you want a medium size, come here. (laughs) But the point is, wherever in the Christian faith you go, dwell in the Word. Look at what God tells us in the scriptures. That's how he talks to us today. And it's available in a language that you can understand with God's help. The Spirit will help you. He will give you the truth. And the truth will set you free. Till Jesus comes and takes all his children to be with him in heaven forever. That's why God said, I declare you to be holy, righteous, my child. Amen. Salvation God to us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot.